by x-ray and 90% uh, of the fractures of 99 can be treated without surgery. All you do there is a uh, um, phalanthus um, or there's what you call a figure of eight bandage, something like that and you just leave it for a few uh, three to four weeks and then you start rehabilitation. So remember, uh, the fracture management, if you think of reductions of clavicle fractures, only way to reduct is indirect method. We put a figure of eight, that's not here. Uh, figure of eight bandage or all that. Um, malunion may be a problem, but uh, the function wise, the outcome is good in clavicle fractures. Um, out of one third fractures with uh, AC joint dislocations may need um, open reduction, but nothing much to tell about these fractures because they are very um, uh, uh, easily managed. Scapular fractures again, very rare. You won't see them much, but scapula is a bone that has uh, uh, come, it's been covered with uh, multiple muscles. So most of the scapular fractures does not need any surgery. Uh, AC joint dislocation is another thing which you just need to diagnose on x-ray. Um, fractures of the glenoid socket or uh, Sternoclavicular uh, dislocation, which is in the middle part where the clavicle uh, meets in the sternum. Um, these are again very rare and also um, all of, almost all are managed conservatively. Shoulder dislocation is an important point, <laughs> important topic. Uh, you might see them and they might ask you what to do. Um, remember, uh, in shoulder, uh, the high chance of dislocation is due to the anatomy where there's one third. Uh, the socket is about one third of a um, um, uh, globe, but the uh, ball is sort of high. So it's a flat glenoid, which is um, enhanced by the labrum. Um, anterior dislocation is the commonest type. Um, and classically, it's started with external rotation, like that, and abduction injury. Um, usually, the patient knows feels that it has popped out. And if you see, you can see the normal contour of the shoulder here. This contour is lost, it's flat. Glenoid is empty, this is called empty glenoid sign. Uh, glenoid is empty. And uh, com always compare the opposite side. Um, nerve injury is common as obviously is the accelerator now, but uh, that uh, we don't uh, sort of Unlike the radial nerve, we don't uh, sort of uh, go our face too much, and the, uh, that injury is also quite rare. Um, just like any other injury, you have pain, and the patient usually classically supports the shoulder from the other side. X ray is diagnostic, you can see the empty glenoid. Uh, That's a classic empty glenoid, and this is anterior dislocation. Now, always remember that in anterior dislocation, the shoulder is inferior to the glenoid. This is not inferior, there's no inferior dislocation as such. Um, anterior dislocation, the shoulder is, if you take a lateral, you see this is anterior, but it's also inferior to the glenoid. This is a classic anterior dislocation. Um, complications are classically rotator cuff tears, nerve injuries. Uh, you can get uh, recurrent dislocation is common because when the rotator cuff injures, injuries of the uh, shoulder can get recurrent, go into recurrent dislocation. That then we need various stabilization procedures for that. Um, posterior dislocation is very rare, about 10%, 90% are anterior dislocation. Um, posterior dislocation is classically seen when the shoulder inward uh, rotates internally then it comes out posterior. Now, internal rotation is not a common movement people do, um, but uh, internal rotators are very powerful. So if you stimulate them either by electric shock or by epileptic fit or any neurological condition, internal rotation uh, can happen and the shoulder can come out posterior. Now remember internal rotation and when you take x-ray, the glenoid is um, usually the shoulder is like within the glenoid, not like the anterior dislocation. It's not obvious. Uh, so this is the head is now come has come out posteriorly, and you can just see the uh, 
greater tuberosity and the, uh, the lateral side facing anterior. So this is called the light bulb side. It's classically seen in um, posterior dislocation of the shoulder on X-ray. Now, recurrent dislocation is a chronic condition. Uh, I'm not going to tell much about it. Um, only thing is, there are various other signs, various lesions, various uh, chronic injuries along the rotator Some are bony injuries, some are soft tissue uh, injuries. And uh, if you have a recurrent dislocation, best option is to stabilize to some stabilization surgical procedure. So these are recurrent dislocation. Let's uh, start about uh, humeral fractures. Um, proximal humerus has separate set of fractures. These are rare, and these you won't get to when we ask much. So and uh, shoulder anterior shoulder dislocation is something you might have to read a bit more. Um, this is just for covering purposes. You have what you call the proximal humerus is divided into four parts according to. Uh, fractures. You have a sharp, then you have a greater tuberosity, you have a lesser tuberosity, and a head. So, <coughs> according to the fracture, we, there's a classification called uh, two part, three part, four part fractures. This is a four part fracture. Two part is uh, just head and the sharp. Uh, then, if you, if the gate is able to go out and head, and lesser tuberosity, sharp, um, uh, great tuberosity fracture happens. And the lesser tuberosity is connected to the humerus, uh, but the head and the shaft is separate, it becomes three part. Uh, lesser tuberosity also goes up, it becomes four part. So, but don't worry about that too much. Um, and then you can have associated fracture dislocations also. Um, fracture of the shaft of humerus, um, this is again common. You might be given in x rays or even a short case sometimes. Uh, not acute fractures, but fractures that go on, go on into complications like malunion, non-union, if they are given as short cases, um, usually they will give a humeral sharp fracture because it's um, easy to examine and you can sort of tell. Uh, indirect or direct uh, injuries, you have uh, classically that's fracture, though this is, if you see the fracture can be a spiral fracture. Sharp fracture, um, commonest thing you must learn is that there are three anatomical um, Involvements in uh, uh, sorry, nerve involvements related to humerus. There are three nerves that are going very close into the humerus. Upper one third, upper neck, the axillary nerve goes close. So, all upper fractures, axillary nerve is liable to get it. Sharp fracture is the radial nerve that goes in the radial group. So, always radial nerve and wrist drop is maybe a complication on a sharp fracture. And then a distal fractures, what you call supracondylar fractures or distal uh, fractures is the ulnar nerve which is going behind the media epicondyle of the humerus. So that anatomical relation between the three bones is important. There are various structure patterns. This is uh, the uh, classification about the configuration as, as I spoke about the uh, these classifications in the, in the introductory lecture, lecture uh, transverse, oblique or spiral. Managing humeral shaft again, non-operative we can be managed. It's a broad um, uh, thing usually. Um, you can even put a humeral brace. Operative, of course, there are various methods. Simple methods of operative, what you call open reduction and internal fixation, either nails or plates and screws. So uh, broad, on a broad base, the two internal fixation methods are plates and screws or nails. That's what you have to know. Um, any fracture, that's a two commonest uh, internal fixation methods. So that's a brace. That's the arm sling. That's some examples of internal uh, fixation with plates and screws. And that's some nail. These are old ones, what you call rush pins. We don't use them. We have proper humeral nails. And that's the proper humeral nail, which is called locking nail. So there are various ways of managing these fractures. Sometimes if there's a wound, we put an external fixator like that. Yesterday I said when there's a compound fracture, there's a wound associated with it, then you do an external 
fixation. Supracondyle fractures again. This is very important. This comes under supracondyle fracture is important to know about it. Uh, mainly seen in pediatric case group. So it's a pediatric fracture and a uh, couple of things you have to know. Uh, the commonest thing you have to know about supracondyle is that, that it beats a lot. And um, let's, let's just go through all that. Uh, condyle fractures are rare, like capital of of the humerus. Um, this is uh, given because most of these fractures are, can see, be seen in pediatric or adult groups, some mostly pediatric groups. If ever, is everybody there at the moment? Is it clear? Uh, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, yes, sir. Okay, so let's uh, go. Um, Supracondyle, I need to tell us a bit more. I should uh, not put this. Uh, uh, I need to add a bit more. One thing about supracondyle practice you have to know is the fact that it can bleed and it can. Uh, cause uh, compression of uh, distal pulses, mainly it can cause the brachial artery to uh, get compressed and it can have uh, distal loss of uh, circulation. So you have to take radial and ulnar uh, pulses, always in supracondyle fracture, mainly when you reduce it sometimes. Um, elbow dislocation, again, this is the normal triangle. In a dislocation, this triangle is lost. That's one of the ways to Clinically, see. Elbow dislocation always, this is most of the time, it's posterior with ulnar growth. Sometimes you can have a fracture dislocation. This is a fracture and a dislocation. This is just an elbow dislocation. And this is the classic sign where the prominence of the uh, olecranon is felt posteriorly. Um, this is again manipulation on the anesthesia. You can reduce it um, just like shoulder. Now, shoulder dislocation, again, reduction method, you have to know. Uh, I have not sort of covered that. You have to uh, know the caucus manual. That's the commonest way of reducing it. Um, you probably have to read about it, uh, or somebody will demonstrate what to do. Uh, just make a note of it, um, how to reduce a, a anterior dislocation of the shoulder. The radial head fractures, classically, there's something called pulled elbow. That is, in children, when they fall or when they um, uh, when they sort of uh, try to cross the road or something, the parents pull their children by their uh, wrist. And then commonest thing that can happen is the radial head comes out of the annular ligament. Um, the annular ligament is the one that is going around the ulna and keeping the radial head nicely inside to make the proximal radial ulna joint. Um, and then this has to be reduced, otherwise the child will keep it, it he won't move it. Um, proximal radial fractures, again, there's so many classifications, we don't do, uh, we don't know much about it at all. Um, there's both, a lot of debate about to do surgery or not, or things like that. I don't think it's beyond the scope of this lecture. Um, but remember that pro proximal radial fractures are radial head fractures and radial neck fractures. So there are various types, that's the radial head, that's community fracture, that's the radial neck fracture. Here it's very important that the posterior interosis nerve goes around this, and you can have a wrist drop if it gets damaged. That's the radial head fracture. You can fix them. You can even replace the radial head. That's a, another thing, if the head is fully commuted, or you can just excise the radial head. Olecranon fractures is more common, um, and it's important to understand olecranon fractures have to be, it's, so it's a part of their uh, severely displaced fractures. It's a, it gets affects your flexion and extension and elbow function. So most olecranon fractures, unless they are undisplaced, will need surgery. So that's a classic fracture of the olecranon. And the uh, operation we do is called tension band wiring, where you put two wires and put a figure of weight bandage, sorry, figure of weight um, uh, wire along two straight K wires. So, but you don't have to know about it, but remember that most displaced alacrona fractures will need surgery because otherwise the flexion extension uh, gets affected. And so, you can't afford a malunion now. Uh, you need a perfect reduction. If it's undisplaced, then you can put a plaster for six weeks and keep. 
same about forearm fracture. Now, forearm fractures can be single bone or both bones. Um, and there are two special fractures until you, uh, one is called Montilla, one is called Galassi. That is two fracture dislocation. Now, whatever the forearm fracture, classic mechanism is fall on outstretched hand. All fractures are like that. And this is a classic forearm fracture. If this does, is not reduced anatomically, the pronation supination gets affected. So therefore, this, unlike the humerus fracture, is a single bone, you can afford some sort of manual union, some sort of rotational deformity because the function won't get affected much. Here you need the perfect anatomical reduction. So these kind of fractures, unless they are to both undisplaced, 90% or majority will need open reduction and internal fixation to get the best function. That's what you had to know about forearm fracture. So initial management, putting a splint, all those comes under general management. But I'm only emphasizing these points with regard to uh, selected fractures. Montiglia fracture is this classically where you have a fracture of the uh, ulna shaft and dislocation of the radial head, proximal dislocation. So ulna shaft is fractured, gets shortened and radial head gets dislocated and gets out of radio humeral joint. That's called a Montiglia fracture. These are examples of Montiglia fractures. The Galassi fracture is the opposite. There's a fracture of the radius with dislocation of the distal radio ulna joint here. This is the fracture. These are two fracture dislocations. You don't need, I don't think you need to know about it, but uh, what is important is when you suspect a fracture like that, you have to take the bone above. I told you to be invincible. Uh, there may be dislocation here because the mechanism is not it's very strong. Uh, just taking this X-ray is not enough. Uh, this is, you have to get the joint above and joint below and the whole bone. So proximal uh, humerus, sorry, uh, the elbow joint, the proximal part of radial, uh, radius and ulna all have to be taken when you see something like that. So if you're a house officer, you need to order all these X-rays. These are classic examples of forearm fracture. They are all been treated by uh, surgery. Then distal radial fractures. Another important thing um, about distal radial fractures is um, the colossus fracture. Now, that you have to know, like uh, shoulder dislocation, uh, supracondylar fracture, and colossus fracture probably are the more important ones. Uh, you know, we need to know a bit more because it's very, very common. Uh, Smith fracture and Barbie fracture, you don't know too much. I'll just say what they are. And there are other fractures. So, colossus fracture, again, fall on outstretched hand. Uh, this colossus, uh, Abraham Collis, who's, who uh, introduced uh, initially in 1864, described this fracture classically in osteoporotic uh, female uh, bone. Um, so, it's made, majority of the fractures are seen in um, females who are uh, postmenopausal females who do develop osteoporosis. Um, and a classic feature of osteoporotic fracture is that it's a fracture that um, occurs with relatively less trauma. Sometimes people just sit and it breaks. And uh, if you, if somebody asks in Vivas, what are the classic places of osteoporotic fractures occur? One is the distal radius, other one is the neck of femur, and third one is the spine, vertebral fractures. Those are three common spaces of osteoporotic fractures of, um, uh, okay. But this fracture is of all an outstretched head with minimal trauma um, in osteoporosis. If, um, it was not described in normal bone. Uh, and the classic deformity is the distal segment gets displaced dorsally. Remember all the Ds, distal this segment gets displaced dorsally, causing a dinner for deformity. So that's classically distal fragment is dorsally, or uh, distal fragment is displaced uh, dorsally, falling like a dinner form, like that. That's the classic deformity of polish fracture. Now, there's so many deformities, which is we um, teach in uh, postgraduate orthopedics. 
uh, there are various things, you don't have to know all that, but these are all the deformities that happen, can happen in a college fracture. How do you treat it? 90% of the college fractures are manipulation and anesthesia due to the POP cast. If the maximum we do is put some uh, wires outside if you can't hold the fracture only with a cast. Open reduction is rare in college fracture. In a young person, maybe we will consider fixing it with plates. These are all rare conditions. So, as far as you are concerned, probably most fractures can be treated with manipulation and plaster casting for six weeks. Um, you can put either full cast or half a cast or a backslab. Half a cast is a backslab. Um, backslab is usually better initially because uh, if there's any swelling, uh, then uh, there's some room for the slab to expand. If you put full cast in time, then you can get what you call compartment syndrome. What are the complications? Nerve and muscle injury. It can cause malunion. You can it can cause radio and carpal injuries, carpal disorder, and then finally it can cause secondary osteoarthritis and joint sickness. These are general complications of fractures as well. This is uh, something I told you, complex regional pain syndrome is a complication which you can any forearm fracture due to tight casting. Which if you want to read more about it, it's like I said, you can uh, read why it happens. It's called CRP. So now it's called complex regional pain syndrome. And just to cover, Smith fracture is totally the opposite of Paris. You fall on an inward hand. Um, and then the dorsal segment is displays anterior and it's called a garden spade deformity like compared to dinner fork disorder that's a garden spade the interior class thumbs down not displaced also so that's a smith fracture smith fractures and uh, barton fracture barton fracture is actually interarticular those will most of the time will need surgery uh, but you can put a plaster uh, manipulation on the anesthesia with the plaster um, but um, uh, unlike police fracture, this will sometimes need a, uh, most of the time needs plating because this distal fragment won't stay. It just keeps on popping and then the function of the risk gets affected. Um, the two other differences, uh, this, if you put a plaster in Smith uh, the police fracture, you can put a back slab um, below elbow. Uh, we never put above elbow for colleagues, um, but uh, for uh, Smith fracture, you have to uh, put a plaster above. Injuries of the hand, these are very rare. Carpal instability, we don't talk. Scaphoid fractures, you have to understand, uh, know because one of the commonest things about scaphoid fractures is it can go into um, avascular necrosis. So you put a plaster in scaphoid fractures. Sometimes they put a screw to fix it. Um, most of the time you can put a plaster. Um, sometimes you ha can have a scaphoid in a dislocation, but you have to follow these patients up for three months or six weeks, or sometimes six months, and may do MRI or something to find out whether it will get gone into avascular necrosis. Then we have base of first metacarpal fractures. Then various uh, other fractures of the pharyngeus, this and mallet finger, these are, the mallet finger can be a short case. Mallet finger is, um, this you don't need to know, uh, you won't get this, it has been taken out. This is called hand injuries, perineal dislocations, some of the injuries. For hand injuries, we don't have to put cars, we can do spins. So that's a metacarpal fracture that also can put a cross. Rotation is a problem. This we must check. We can fix them. Um, just give me a minute. Uh, I need to get this call. Can you? Are you all there? Hello. Is everybody there? Uh, yes, sir. Just give me a minute. I need to get a call. Just uh, give me two minutes break, okay? Okay,
sorry. Um, so, um, scarified fractures, again, fall on the outstretched hand. Scarified works like that. You have a uh, couple of clinical features you can see. One is you have tenderness at the anatomical snuff box. Then when you tell us telescope means you push the uh, thumb into the glass snuff box. Um, you get uh, uh, pain. Then you have uh, X-ray, uh, if you do, you can see the fracture. Sometimes X-rays are not very clear in scarified fractures. You have to, this is one of the fractures you have to do CT or MRI or a bone scan. Hello? Hello? In on. Oh, in on. <laughs> My mom is Zoom. Yeah, Zoom meeting again. Sorry, so um, um, this is another classic. Sometimes we can go, we have to go up to a bone scan mainly to discover, uh, discover a vascular neck process. Um, in scarified fractures. So scarified fractures is something uh, what in your level, if you consider pass out, when you suspect um, pain, uh, a patient come with chronic pain in the wrist and things like that, it's always good to, uh, um, if you're not doing orthopedics, but it'll refer to orthopedic person. It's not like um, a general surgery or any other place where you can manage. So if you're doing very, uh, tricky thing. So, what you need is to uh, know how to identify and then probably refer to further management. Benef structure is another fracture that's a uh, fracture of the base of the proximal phalanx of the thumb. And uh, you just put a splint like that. You don't put we, earlier we used to put thumb spike or plasters. Now we can put splints. You can fix it with K wires. Uh, Scaffold fracture is a plaster you put like that, or you can put a brace. So, in forearm and hand, you can put plasters or braces. Nowadays, there are a lot of braces, or you can fix it with a screw like that. Complication of scaphoid is AVF. Phalanger fractures, like that. Phalanger fractures. Remember, phalanx, you, the commonest thing you can do with, you don't need to fix them. These fractures, the commonest thing we do is we splint it using another finger, which we call a body strapping. This is a classic treatment of a phalanx fracture. You use a good finger on either side and strap it to the other one and keep it. It's called a body strapping. It's a uh, dislocation of the finger. Like that. You just put a strap, uh, reduce these, so can we even reduce on the ring block in the A&E, &E. um, and then you put a split like that, or you can put a body stepping also. Any questions? Um, sir, regarding the scaphoid fracture, yes. Uh, if you put a cast uh, if there's like a damage to blood vessels, uh, would the cast be enough? Um, no, it won't happen. So, damage to the blood vessels is very internal. The scaphoid uh, artery uh, to the scaphoid is end artery that comes uh, like a nutrient artery uh, uh, through the bone and it gets uh, crushed. So, uh, that gets disrupted surely by the fracture uh, that that doesn't get compressed externally by putting plasters um it's not like uh, you know the radial or anything like that gets plaster but if you uh, put a tight plaster anyway the distal whole of distal circulation gets affected not only scaphoid colleges but the plaster the 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 commonest blood vessels that get uh, uh, compresses the radi uh, radial artery and the ulnar the, the two main blood supply of the forearm so then no scaphoid artery and all the distal arteries get compressed anyway. 
it's not a it's not that tough per se but tight plaster can basically um, damage full of distal circulation it's not only the scaphoid um, the, the, that's the problem that's why you have to, all these tight plasters doesn't damage minute arteries they are they compress major arteries and major points for example the brachial artery or the radial ulna or the popliteal artery like that so um, the deep arteries and minute arteries getting damaged to uh, plaster is very rare uh, but uh, swelling itself sometimes can uh, reduce circulation causing compartment syndrome any other question i don't know whether we need to do shall we do this so uh, this is just couple of uh, questions you need to think of list all possible injuries caused by fall of outstretched hand or they will tell describe in detail in etiology clinical feature in the scheme management of police structure nowadays you won't get this question but these are descriptive questions where you try to uh, think and answer nowadays they give clinical scenarios so you won't get questions like that so uh, i will uh, shall we do the lower limb one also now Okay, sir. Shall we uh, do the lower limb fractures as well? Okay, we'll take a just again. I need to make few calls. Can you stay on line for about five minutes? Let me just get the other fracture. Fractures of the lower. Can you see that? Not yet, sir. I just opened through. I just opened through the. I didn't open through that battery. Ah, yes. Now? Now can you see? Is everybody there? Yes, sir. We can see the screen. Is it okay? Okay, just. Uh... So fractures of the lower limb. Sir, again, sir, sir, uh, so we can't see the PowerPoint present presentation. Are you done? Uh, yes, sir. We can only see the screen, not the presentation. That's like a list of applications there. That's all. Oh, okay. Now it opened. Uh, no. Now. No sir, not yet. No sir, I think you have selected. You have selected to share the PowerPoint. That's why I have selected through PowerPoint. Yes, like last time I did the same thing. Now, what is the screen you see? It's the application screen, sir. The okay. So in that, I select the PowerPoint here. No? No, sir. Okay, wait, wait. You can see my cousin now, right? 
yes sir we can see your cursor on the screen but not the presentation okay now i'm going to click it then you can it opens to the my fracture with uh, powerpoint lecture series right no sir no sir uh so i think can you like uh, now screen sharing and try again yeah okay wait. I can't even see my screen. Wait, wait. Can you see my screen? Yes. Sir. Still the previous answer. Okay, okay. okay. I have put a uh, uh, started a new share. Yes, sir. Now, now, sir. So I'll stop sharing. So I think you should first uh, open the particular PowerPoint presentation and. I have opened the presentation, but it's not. It says I'm sharing. Wait, wait. Now I'm going to share the desktop. Okay. Now we can see my desktop, right? Yes, sir. Now you can see my presentation. Not the presentation, sir. It's a list of presentations. Now, if I open that, ah, yes. Now we can see. Okay. Now we can see, right? Yes. Okay. So we'll do uh, fractures and dislocation of uh, lower limb. Just like upper limb, we'll go through the uh, in systematic way. Again, I'll emphasize what's important. Um, so we have pelvic fractures, tip dislocation, then neck of femur, fracture, sharp, distal femur, and petal fractures. We have knee dislocation, some ligament injuries around the knee, you might not need to know that. Then you have tibia, uh, fractures of the leg, the plateau fractures, and the sh sharp fractures. Fibular head and ankle fractures. These are the common areas of fractures. Injury to the foot is just like uh, uh, upper limb. You have talus calcaneum and hind foot. You have metatarsal and phalangeal fractures. So this is just a full overview. But let's see.
in pelvic fractures what you have to remember the single most important thing is not pelvic fracture initial management is the most important if the patient comes with high energy usually there are high energy trauma severely uh, deformed rts you have to do the uh, initial survey look for all the soft tissue injuries pelvic fractures one of the commonest problems is they bleed significantly so you have to put a pelvic bind or something to arrest bleeding uh, as a first aid and then you must look for soft tissue injury so especially organs around pelvis pelvic fracture itself can be managed conservatively or fixed not immediately it may be usually um, uh, at a later date initial management is always uh, most of the time is conservative to stop bleeding and stabilize the pelvis pelvic fractures usually need ct and mri you need 3d reconstruction because it's uh, very complex these are called complex fractures see there are various types you don't need to know all that uh, that's a ring fracture pelvis is made from all around like a ring two ends go out now this is just a ring fracture and this goes up it's called ring or shear fractures this is uh, then they have lateral there are compressions either it's the energy comes like that fall from a height or the compress get crushed injury patient gets stuck between the windscreen and the seat something like that and uh, you have various combination injuries. remember the management is atls protocol soft tissue management is important and then you can fix it either internal or external fixation that's a classic pelvic bind that we put for pelvic fractures two ends are brought together and tight you can just put a sheet just to arrange that's the external fixator that's the external screws fixing again acetabular fractures you should not i don't think you need to know this at all uh, let's go to posterior uh, dislocation so like anterior dislocation of the shoulder is the commonest posterior dislocation of the hip is the commonest but to dislocate the hip is you need significant trauma not like the shoulder because hip has two thirds um, socket is about two thirds of a uh, globe uh, and it's not a shallow socket it's a deep socket and there are a lot of strong uh, um, uh, muscles and uh, tendons and ligaments around them diagnosis is by x-ray reduction uh, then you have three week uh, usually uh, you do reduce reduce and then you have put traction and keep usually uh, posterior dislocation you, once it reduces you have to wait for the soft tissues to heal so earlier they should put traction for 3 weeks and keep but now they don't put traction but you don't put weight or non weight bearing you have to keep for about 3 weeks remember the sciatic nerve injury and the commonest other thing is that can happen is avascular necrosis neck of femur fractures and posterior dislocation can damage the that supply to the head of the uh, femur then always it can go into second osteoarthritis how do you reduce it so classically remember uh, clinically when you see a dislocation the limb is shortened because this goes posterior dislocation it again goes up anterior dislocation goes anterior and down posterior goes posterior and up anterior dislocation of shoulder is i told you it's anterior and down this is posterior and up so there's always um, there's always shortening there's shortening and it's internally located this is classic for dislocation this toward the opposite in neck of femur where there's externally rotated attitude of the limb is externally rotated the long this is how you reduce it's a two point thing you have to put the patient earlier they used to keep them on the ground or operating table should be reduced as much as possible to the side somebody stabilizes the pelvis somebody pulls for traction and also gentle flexion and adduction so traction flexion adduction and internal rotation that's the maneuver to reduce this neck of femur fracture again remember this classification you have a uh, neck of femur fractures are around the neck of femur is this classification is important so I'm, that's why i'm going to take some time and tell 5 cm below the uh, lesser trochanter that is 5 cm below the lesser trochanter and anything up up to the head these are all neck of femur fractures from the neck up to 5 cm below below that is sharp fractures 
So this lesser trochanter, five centimeters below is called a subtrochanteric fracture, below the trochanter. Between the greater and lesser trochanter is intertrochanteric fracture. Uh, the neck can be base, transcervical, that is between the cervical, cervi cervi cervical means the neck, transcervical is in the neck, base is in the base of the neck, subcapital is at the head neck junction. Remember, this is the head, this is the neck, this is the head neck junction, and this is the neck sharp junction, the base. So, other thing is the capsule attachment of the hip is between the trochanters in the intertrochanteric line and intertrochanteric crest posterior. So, anything above that, that is, these three fractures are considered intracapsular. These are extracapsular. Now, the management differs between intracapsular and extracapsular fractures. Now, blood supply gets damaged most in intracapsular fractures because blood supply comes from the arteries around the neck, it goes on the capsule and supplies these are in the arteries. Um, now, the other two things you must remember, I'll show you from the classification itself. Anything there is a neck, um, the management is of overall neck of femur fractures depends on the age of the patient and the configuration of the fracture. Those two important considerations you must think. First of all, if the patient is young and not osteopor uh, osteoporosis uh, or osteoporotic, and you have to preserve the head, all these subcapital transcervical basal fractures, you have to fix it with screws and give a chance, hoping there's no AVN develops. Elderly person, you can remove and replace by hemiarthroplasty or something like that, as long as the neck, anything part of the neck is there. In the trochanter fractures, you have to fix it with a dynamic hip screw. So, young patients, subcapital screws, old people, subcapital prosthesis, the others, plates or nails, DHS or nails, you can fix. That is not extra capture of fractures. So that's the DHS, that's the uh, nail. That's a hemiarthroplasty, actually it's a bipolar hemiarthroplasty. That's screws. That is a young patient is a intracapsular fracture. Remember this and remember uh, to read a bit more about neck of femur fractures and posterior dislocation, mainly neck of femur fracture. That's uh, again like Wallis fracture, it's an important area in uh, orthopedics. Sharp fractures, again very uh, just a single like humerus, but difference is unlike humerus, this needs surgery. 80% of the humeral fractures, you don't need surgery, but this needs surgery because it's a weight bearing bone, it's a biggest bone, and the commonest problem with sharp fractures is a um, lot of bleeding up to one liter. I can hold about one liter of blood. So that's uh, the important thing to know about sharp fractures, and these will need some sort of surgical fixation, nail or plates. So, have a sharp initial screen. This is initial management. You use, use the other side. This is first aid. You use the other leg and an umbrella or something rod in between and cut together for sprinting. That reduces pain and that also reduces um, bleeding. This is called a Thomas splint. This is another thing we used to use. Now we don't use much. You put the track there and then you put a uh, bind here and pull this. And then this gets straightened. Then earlier they used to do traction, now we don't do this, non-operative management, we always operate. It's an old traction. Younger patients, we do it still. Like young, one or two year old, we don't operate. In children, we don't operate, we manage conservative most of the time. There are some examples of fractures of uh, sharp, this is the nail, and that's a plate. Supracondyle, again, remember, supracondyle fracture can be in humerus or in uh, femur. Again, they need some sort of surgery. You don't need all these classifications. Patella fracture is just like the olecranon. Patella um, gets damaged. If it's undisplaced patella fracture, then you will need, uh, you can put a plaster. 
displaced patella fracture what happens is the extensor mechanism the extension of the leg gets involved because the patella uh, remember the extensor mechanism is quadriceps quadriceps tendon patella then ligamentum patella and the tibial tuberosity anything along this extensor mechanism is affected so you have to repair this again just like olecranon if it's undisplaced, as I said, you put a POP cast or cylinder, transfer this space factor, you have to do surgery. Very rarely, if it's a small fragment here, we can remove and just suture. There are various classifications, and transfers, lower pool, all that. I don't think you need to know all that. Ligament injuries of the knee as an undergraduate level, you just need to know these are sports injuries. X-rays are normal, but you'll have massive swelling. The person can't walk. If a patient comes with an injured knee with massive swelling, can't walk, severely injured, X-rays are normal, you have to suspect some sort of a ligament injury. There are main six ligaments are the two menisci, the anterior and posterior cushion ligaments, medial and lateral collateral ligaments. Some injury can happen usually twisting sports injuries so remember if there's severe pain patient can't walk x-rays are normal they're swelling you suspect a ligament injury they are as serious as fractures and you must always uh, refer to some orthopedic or someone who knows to um, identify this temporary you can always put a spin or a back slab or something like that or even a brace knee braces are available these days the brace like that. Um, then you have to do MRI scan to see the ligaments. CT scans, as I said, are good for bones, MRI for soft tissues. Management can be either conservative or operating. Mostly you manage initial period conservatively or the swelling goes. ACL uh, anterior cushion ligaments, 99% or 9% of the last need surgery. Some uh, collateral ligaments can be managed conservatively, but there are a lot of grading of injuries. And, uh, unstable knees and things like that, they are, I think, purely uh, beyond the scope of this. That's the knee brace. You can always put a knee brace if you suspect injury, a, knee, a ligament injury. You don't need to put a plaster. Tibial plateau fracture, again, this is a intra articular fracture. Actually, I want to just mention about uh, something, one principle about intra articular fractures is that uh, intra articular fractures need to be. Uh, reduce anatomically. If you think about it, if you don't reduce it anatomically, uh, they co cause a secondary osteoarthritis because the, there is a step in the articular surface and the, it rubs in the other articular surface, causing the early wear and tear of the cartilage. It should be perfectly, perfectly reduced. So most tibial plateau fractures need surgery. There are various classifications. You don't need to know this is called Schatzer classification. So principles of Managing any intra-articular factor, activate anatomical reduction. You have to stable fixate, so you have to do internal fixation in plates and screws. Early mobilization, so joint has to be bent forward and straightened early. Otherwise, it goes into step class. But weight bearing should be laid because all these uh, intra-articular factors are cancellous both. So if you put weight on it, then it gets crushed. These are the common complications. This is just today management of article fracture. That's how we have to do it, external fixators or internal fixators. You can put ring fixators. Now we have ring fixators. We have, uh, another thing I want to tell is compartments of the leg. Remember this is a common question. It can come in vascular surgery. It can come in orthopedics. Leg has four compartments, anterior, lateral, deep posterior, Superficial posterior. There's no medial compartment. When I, when I ask what are the four compartments, you can say anterior, posterior, medial, lateral. Uh, there's anterior compartment, there's a lateral compartment, and the superficial and posterior compartment. Medially, there's tibia in the medial. So there's no medial compartment. These are the four compartments. Compartment syndrome should be diagnosed because it's important to identify that. Otherwise, it can cause problems. Uh, compartment syndrome, managing compartment syndrome is also something you probably will learn in general surgery. Uh, but you have to know about that. That's another important area. They will ask questions to raise an emergency. Compartment has to be decompressed for most of the time. Fibula and tibia fractures, unlike forearm, there's no pronation supination. So uh, compared to forearm fractures, tibia 
and female fractures can be managed conservatively or with a MU and a POP. All of them doesn't need surgery. There's some need for surgery, but you must know this, this can be managed conservatively. If there's a wound, you can't, this needs manipulation because this the fixation with the pain, plus plates, plus external fixation. Ankle fractures, again, is important area. It's a sports injury or something. You have bimalleolus, so ankle has a lateral malleolus, medial malleolus, sharp. So I, both goes means bimalleolus. If one goes, it's called a unimalleolus fracture, either medial malleolus or a lateral malleolus. Sun twist injury or fall from a height. Now remember, what uh, sometimes you have ankle sprain. That is the classic where, time where you have the lateral uh, uh, tail of fibular ligament. This is the fibula. It's the tail is down here. Tail of fibular ligament gets uh, avals, and you don't feel a fracture, but you have a lot of swelling. There's a classification. You don't need to know about it. Initial management of ankle fractures is most important. If it's, there's a fracture dislocation, if, uh, you must quickly take it to a better position uh, in the ETU uh, and put a uh, 90 degree back slab. The biggest problem with ankle fractures is it tends to swell so fast and so rapidly. It bleeds heavily and it can cause a lot of problems. Even skin can get necrosis. So you have to uh, initially reduce and immobilize ankle fracture. Strains are managed with any strain in the body is managed with a simple uh, four principles. What do you call rest, ice, compression, and elevation. So remember the mnemonic rise. So the rise is for strains. Rest, ice, compression, and compression is uh, compression bandage and keep the area elevated. Ankle fractures, initial management. It's right, but you have to fix them. Most fractures need fixation. Medial is close, laterally, uh, uh, what do you call it? Planes. This you don't need to know much. Uh, calcaneal fracture, you have to just need talus fractures and calcaneal fractures. Talus is another place you can get avascular necrosis, just like scaphoid. Um, calcaneal fractures. Um, Sometimes you have to uh, put a screw, but you can manage conservative. Uh, this is classic fall from a height. If somebody falls from a height on the calcium, you can get uh, fractures. You don't need to know this too much. Again, I need to tell something about what you call a stress fracture here. Stress fracture is a fracture that you have minute, repetitive minute trauma can cause uh, fracture or bone to break at certain levels. Classically, you see um, uh, military personnel who keep on marching for a march fracture, uh, and they are seen in metatarsal, uh, sometimes in tibia, sometimes in um, spine or hip is rare. And march fracture is a classic stress fracture. Stress fracture is a con continuous minor trauma, like people who keep on mar marching or hitting the foot on the ground. The, the bone cracks and you can't even see he, they come with pain initially the, it's normal because it's only a hairline crack but six weeks later when you take you have seen a massive callus formed around it then all you can see oh there was a fracture sorry you, hello oh, oh. Mm. Oh, 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 Max, you like it. No, 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 coxia, I grant. Panadine, well, we do the parasitic of Sartre. I grant for a party talk. What have you been done? It's what it's a government in good man. Sorry. Um, 
yeah i just actually covered certain thing let me just before finishing tell you uh, so in lower limb remember the neck of femur uh, fracture uh, posterior dislocation of the humerus then um, basic uh, principles of uh, managing ankle sprain or ankle uh, fracture uh, metatarsal fractures or phalangeal fractures are same like hand you put body scraping and things like that you don't need to know all specific fractures in lower limb uh, initial management of fractures most of the time uh, femoral shaft fractures initial management uh, and then uh, important points regarding different fractures is important so we've done pelvic fractures, hip dislocation, uh, fracture femur, uh, knee dislocation we have not done. I've not spoken about knee dislocation or patellar dislocation because that's very rare. Usually the knee gets dislocated and then it's a bit nasty injury, it comes back. And the most important thing is it causes all sorts of disruption to the popliteal artery uh, result, but it's very, very rare. So I've not written, but ligament injuries of the knee is common. Uh, initial management of ligament, of, uh, ligament injuries is important. Uh, in the leg, I've covered the important ones. Fibular head, we have not covered. You don't need to know much about it. Just like radial head, fibular head can cause damage to uh, fibular um, common peroneal nerve, which hooks around and cause foot drop, just like uh, posterior interosis can call wrist drop. Uh, injuries on the foot, uh, again, let's go on through this. You don't need to know much about it. Um, I think that's about it. Uh, any questions? So uh, regarding the stress fractures, how would you um, sorry? diagnose it? Uh, the stress fractures, if it's not seen on x-ray, how would you um, diagnose It's difficult to diagnose stress fractures unless you uh, uh, suspect it. Uh, sometimes it says are normal. Sometimes you look very carefully, you can see a hairline crack. Um, but uh, if you really want to diagnose that something is going on, then you can do a CT um, or MRI. Uh, CT you can do and you can probably diagnose. But uh, what we do is for stress fractures, we it's a clinical suspicion. We treat initially. Uh, as a stress fracture, and if you get the classic history where somebody is on a repeatedly repetitive movement, like joggers or runners, we rest the area, and then uh, we manage with a sprint or something like conservative management, and then uh, we see. Uh, it, the problem is it gets worse uh, if you keep on doing whatever the, uh, the activity they are doing. Uh, but if you want to read a diagnosis, you go for a CT sometimes. So, uh, uh, if you don't see a hairline crack, other option you can take a um, extra of the opposite side and compare. Sometimes when you compare, you can see the disturbance on this side, but it's very difficult sometimes. Any other question? Um, yes, sir. Um, regarding the CT, are there any other situations where a CT is more suitable than an X-ray? So, uh, in uh, orthopedics, uh, CTs can be used when you suspect the fact, uh, fracture, but it, uh, two things. One is you can't diagnose from x-ray. The second thing is when you want to treat and if you want to get a 3D reconstruction and x-ray same detailed configuration of the fracture before treating then you need to get a CT. So complex fractures like pelvic fractures we do CTs. Um, then sometimes uh, vertebral fractures we do CTs. If you, before you treat you would want to know the full complex. For example tibial plateau fracture. Comminuted fractures if you have a lot of communication and you are going to operate then you need a CT to see the pieces, where these pieces are before operating. Uh, but otherwise, uh, for diagnosis purposes, CT has a limiting role. But uh, for treatment purposes, if you want to do surgery, to the, like a roadmap to the uh, uh, place where before going into a, your operation to see the anatomy of it, then CT is very helpful to do 3D reconstruction. Thank you, sir. So um, I think we can't do the other one today. Uh, we have two, I think two more. One is bone and joint infections and bone and joint uh, uh, tumors, I think. I just checked that. Um, both are uh, at undergraduate, we can cover both in one, one more lecture like this. Um, infections and tumors. So we'll, uh, only thing is I can't tell exactly when I can set it up. I, we might be able to set it up on uh, 
during this weekend maybe on sunday morning or something can i uh, can you give uh, the who is the in charge asanga uh, right yes can sir you, uh, yeah, give me a call on uh, saturday and just remind then we'll fix a date for to do those two lectures okay 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 sir this uh, one side okay, do all the lectures you sir, know yes, yeah sorry uh, sir uh, can you send us the lecture notes link the lecture notes no sir the, yeah, pro- no, the lecture, power the powerpoint presentation uh, powerpoint i have uh, i have uh, uh, what do you call the uh, got print outs of uh, print out you know the powerpoint uh, lecture note format of the presentation that i actually has given to the department but i will have to uh, um makes uh, i'll have to make the uh, what do you call the powerpoint uh, uh, ara lecture note ar kila inne me, me note series ekak man eka hadala ewanna um, i i can't uh, this this present okay. I'll, i'll send it to you once all four lectures are finished uh, i have a prepared lecture note on the same ara slides ekara ekama side ekak thiyenne me 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 set ekak what do you call uh, yes uh, i can send that um mang evanna once i finish the four lectures i'll send all together i'll send it to you on a email okay okay sir thank you okay